you. Well, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Richard Pan, and I'm a pediatrician. I've uh, practiced for uh, over 20 years uh, pediatrics. I'm an educator. I ran the training program at UC Davis, uh, spent time teaching other doctors how to uh, practice. I'm a health services researcher, a student of our healthcare system, and I'm now a legislator working to try to achieve affordable, accessible, quality health care for everyone. Thank you. Great. Now, as we're looking at our health care uh, system, you know, health care has evolved quite a bit over the last century. Um, physicians in the past, most of the time, health care was mainly focused on acute illness or injury. Physicians, good physicians would diagnose diseases, but had very limited treatment options. Uh, people would come and they'd seek help for an acute illness or injury, but few survived long or lived long with a chronic condition. But fortunately, because of advances we've had in healthcare, uh, we've actually increased life expectancy over 20 years in the past century. In fact, people who used to die at an earlier age are now living with a chronic disease. In fact, right now, Californians, 40% of Californians have at least one chronic disease, and we spend about 70 to 80% of our healthcare spending on taking care of chronic disease. But yet, our healthcare system is still rooted in a time, in a time when we were still focusing on acute illness and injury. So what I want you to do is I want you to think about someone who has a chronic illness, a chronic health condition. Perhaps that's a child with asthma, a per parent with high blood pressure, a cousin with diabetes, maybe a friend with cancer. And now think a little bit about how they receive health care right now. Right? You have to remember to take your medications, maybe more than once a day, right? You got before and after, three times a day. You have to go to the pharmacy, pick up your refills, and then there's doctor's appointments, right? You, got, you might have more than one doctor. You have a primary care, a couple specialists, you gotta make those doctor's appointments. Maybe you have several in the same week, certainly several in the same month, having to uh, miss work or school. And then when you show up, you got a, that whole list of questions. My God, I have to remember all these questions I have to ask before I leave the door, right? The doctors complain about the, you know, hand on the, the, the hand on the door question, right, at the end. But you gotta get through that list. And then you get sent for some labs or x-rays and hope those results come out. But most terrifyingly is you show up and your doctor looks at you and says, you know, things aren't going so well and we need you to go to the emergency room in the hospital. And in fact, the way we organize our health care is really around sort of these episodes of care. When these episodes of care, I mean around doctor's visits, emergency room visits, hospitalizations, procedures, and tests. But yet, a chronic condition is something you live with all the time. It's an ongoing activity. It's something that you live with every day. It's not just something that you have and you get cured and it's over. And we need to think about how we take care of people when they have chronic conditions. That 40% of people have at least one chronic condition. And people are working on creating these new models of care. It's like the patient-centered medical home. How do we try to coordinate things to be sure that we can take care of people who have chronic conditions more effectively? Now, in the other realm, we have information technology. And you know, we all have our smartphones. Uh, perhaps, I think probably most people here perhaps have one. I don't know. Uh, but certainly, your computer at home. Uh, we have connectivity all over the place. And this information technology actually can increase our capability to take care of chronic illness. Even as it's ubiquitous in our lives, it can help us with this ubiquitous disease that we may have to deal with. Now, right now, we have something called telehealth. And you've probably seen uh, some, uh, you might have heard of telehealth. Telehealth is when we use telecommunications to deliver healthcare. And in fact, right now, we're using information technology to implement electronic health records, video conferencing with specialists, maybe reading x-rays or taking a look at a picture of your rash remotely. And certainly, that is helping us deliver healthcare more efficiently. It's reducing geographic access. And UC Davis here is an international leader in research in telehealth. But the challenge right now in this current generation of telehealth is that we sort of are just using information technology and layering it onto the existing healthcare system. That is layering it onto these episodes of care, perhaps making these episodes of care more efficient and reducing those geographic barriers, but it's still those episodes of care. 
And so let's think about how can we use technology to actually change the way we take care of people with chronic illness. That ubiquitous technology can be ubiquitous in trying to figure out how do we take care of people on an ongoing basis, not just in these episodes. And I want to call that virtual health. So virtual health is applying technology from basically centering it healthcare delivery from the doctor's office and the hospital to the patient's home, work, and school. And in many ways, even though I'm calling it virtual healthcare or virtual health, it's actually more real than perhaps the healthcare we're getting now, which often takes place distant from where the patient actually lives. In fact, we spend a lot of time in healthcare. In fact, most of healthcare is actually collecting information then processing it and transmitting it back to patients, back to the patient's doctor and their care team. But that's something perhaps we should be able to do more in people's lives and integrate it more into people's lives instead of pe pulling people out of their lives to do this, which is what we're doing now. And in fact, for example, how can we, one of some of the things we should think about, uh, each one of us generates a lot of physiological data, a lot of data that we can self-report about our condition. And there are devices right now like Fitbit that collects physiological data unobtrusively, and I think gives you an example of what the technology is capable of. So in virtual health, what we want to do is actually take care of chronic disease on an ongoing basis, not on an episodic basis. Take care of the disease like the disease is itself, something that goes on all the time. So just as an example, I want to talk about a patient. We'll just call him Tim. Tim has persistent asthma. And you know, he goes to high school, he's on a basketball team. You know, I'm a pediatrician, so I have to talk about someone who I take care of. And uh, he's been prescribed a controller inhaler to try to keep his symptoms under control. He has what's called a rescue inhaler when he has symptoms, symptomatic. And then he has a spirometer that measures his lung capacity, so we know how effectively his treatments are going. And so Tim goes to the, you know, the doctor tells him, you, know, you need to take your controller every day, take your rescue inhaler when you have symptoms, take your spirometer and write down the results on this piece of paper. When you come see me next, we'll go over all of this stuff and see how you're doing. Now, one day, Tim goes to school, and he's been coughing and sneezing a little bit, and he's going off to his basketball game. And when he's at basketball, he's feeling a little short of breath. He takes his rescue inhaler. Now, yeah, didn't really feel much better. And, then he start, and, he gets, and he's start on the court, and he's getting more and more short of breath. And finally, his coach can see him, he's gasping and he's wheezing, calls 911. They take him off to the emergency room. They call his parents, you know, Tim's in the emergency room, you need to go meet him there. They go, the emergency room doctors do their thing, they get him on treatment. A few hours, you know, several hours later, anyone been to the emergency room? Okay, it's not just a few hours. Several hours later, he shows up, you know, he, they stabilize him. And I've been there, we'd say, okay, well, it looks like uh, here's your regimen, follow up with your primary care doctor the next day to go over your asthma management. And so that's what you do. But could we do something differently? And in fact, there are opportunities to keep him from going to the emergency room. And so what I want to do is talk about what would happen if Tim had virtual health. Because after all, we know that 70, about, I think 4,600 Americans every year, every day, um, actually, show up in emergency rooms with asthma attacks. So what can we do with virtual health that perhaps might be different? So in virtual health, Tim and his parents, they agreed to ongoing monitoring of his uh, treatment plan. We have people, innovators, to develop devices that could actually measure uh, when he uses his inhaler, how many times he uses it. They actually spirometer, instead of him writing down a diary, it actually transmits the results to his care team. So when he uh, skips his taking his uh, controller inhaler, you know. He feels good, so why should I take my medication, right? So he skips taking that controller inhaler, and someone actually says, oh, you know, you didn't take your dose. And it sends him a text and says, by the way, you didn't take your controller today, all right? And if he, skips, if he still doesn't take it or he skips a few, the care team gives him a call. The nurse gives him a call and says, hey, what's going on? You know, is there something that's keeping you from using it? Maybe we need to change your medication if this one isn't working for you, all right? So he's gonna be, we're going to be sure he takes his controller every day. Now, they also notice that He's using his rescue inhaler a little more, and they go, oh, what's going on here? And they see the spirometer, which has been transmitting the data, goes to the data center, and it looks like your lung capacity is going down a little bit. So they call him up, and they say, so what's going on? Uh, it looks like you're having a little more trouble. They, he might not have even noticed it. 
He says, well, I've had a sniff and cough, you know, a cough and a little sniffle. I said, well, maybe, sounds like maybe that's trying to trigger your asthma. In fact, uh, we're going to increase, tell you to increase your controller inhaler. We, uh, we're going to increase the dosage there to keep you from getting sicker. And let's see what your rescue inhaler is really doing. So take a puff, repeat your spirometry 15 minutes later. And they can actually see the results. And they go, oh, it looks like you're doing well. Good. Why don't you go to school? We'll have you on this higher dose. He goes to practice. He uses a spirometer again. Lung measurement looks good. OK. And then he goes home, and he's breathing easily. And so what happened is, is that his team's able to follow him. And then he gets a call from his doctor and said, looks like the day went really well. We're going to keep you on this higher dose of the controller for another four days until your cold blows over. And then we can see whether when, that, when your lung capacity is getting better, we'll, we'll, we can lower the dose later. So this is sort of ongoing real-time care. And in fact, what we're doing is we're collecting key information, we're collecting it, analyzing it, sharing it in real time between patients and their doctor. In fact, the physician-led care team that provides a medical home can continually support the patient and their family. We can reduce avoidable hospitalizations and doctor's visits. In fact, uh, what happens is the doctor is actually communicating with the patient more frequently, but, just, but particularly at the time when they really need the care. So it's not just about when you scheduled your visit, it's when you actually need them. And this isn't just about asthma. We can do this for diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, other chronic conditions, self-reported information, hopefully mental health, many other conditions that are chronic diseases. Now, there are many hurdles to overcome before this kind of health, virtual health, is available. You know, our technology is actually present. It's kind of like the Apollo moon mission. The technology was there. They had to put it together to send the man to the moon. That technology is present. But we need to have patients and doctors who want to demand and try these new approaches. We need to have to figure out how do we integrate information technology, similar to the way the financial services industry, perhaps, has done. They have transformed you know, our banking system with IT. We need to do the same in healthcare. We've been lagging behind. Anyone remembers the show, The Six Million Dollar Man? Well, the theme was, we have the technology. We can rebuild him better, faster, stronger. Well, we have the technology. We can rebuild healthcare. But we need leaders, leaders who understand healthcare and the doctor-patient relationship and how important that is to success. Leaders who can create an environment to foster innovative changes, innovative devices to establish that data and interconnectivity infrastructure, but who can also transform patient-centered medical homes and care networks that are better served patients. Leaders who can articulate a vision and bring it to reality. We can re-engineer healthcare to better meet our needs. And together, we can build a healthier future. Thank you. <laughs>